Okay. Um, so we're here today at Heifer Ranch in Perryville, Arkansas, which is sort of the heart of the work Heifer does here in the USA. Um, we're here today with the horticultural manager, Sean Pacera, and with the livestock manager and farm steward, Donna Kilpatrick. We're just going to ask them a little bit about beekeeping, um, why it's important to them, what they do to keep the bee populations healthy, and anything y'all can do at home. So, Sean, I'm going to start with you. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how, you know, what type of beekeeping you do here at the ranch? Yeah, uh, so mainly we manage uh, honeybees. Uh, that's what most people are familiar with. Um, but a lot of the crops that we grow in the garden actually need native bees to pollinate them. Things like uh, tomatoes and squash are actually better, poll uh, blueberries, for example, are better pollinated by native bees. Um, so the health of honeybees is overall an indicator of how the native bees that are, are that live in North America are doing. Um, there's about 3,000 species. Um, so some of those are even in, on the threatened and endangered list. Um, so yeah, they're critically important, especially to vegetables. So what's the best way people at home can sort of support that work? Yeah, it, it, one of the things I've noticed is that there's been a, a, a real rise in what people wanting to get into beekeeping to help the bees, um, having their own beehives or sponsoring another beekeeper to keep hives on their property. Um, there's not necessarily a shortage of bees as there is a shortage of bee forage. Uh, so one of the things that people can do even at home is just being able to plant uh, plants that both honeybees and native bees uh, prefer um, or creating habitat. You can buy like the little cardboard tubes um, that you can sometimes see like a garden store uh, for mason bees or orchard bees to lay their eggs in uh, and overwinter in there. And so just creating habitat and places for the bees to nest uh, and things for them to eat is really the most important way you can support the pollinators. That's great. So I see that you all are right next to a beautiful sign that says pollinator friendly garden. I don't see too many plants behind you, but Donna, could you tell me a little bit about what your team is working on here today? Yeah, sure. So. Um... This is, the bottoms are really where we graze livestock, and for livestock to graze, we, we grow 100% uh, grass-finished cattle and 100% grass-finished lamb. And so, in order, to, in, in order to have a diversified forage for our livestock to eat, we really need to have a diversified forage. So what we're looking at this year is to really mix that up. We're using a company called Green Cover, um, and they have come up with a mix, I believe, of 18 different forages that we're going to be planting in the bottoms. Some of those do require, um, well all of them require pollination. So what we're doing here is putting in an actual inten intentional uh, pollinator garden. We're trying to attract bees as well as other beneficial insects that will help pollinate the cover crops that we're going to be growing we'll, that will then feed our livestock. So why is it important to you to have a variety of forage and, and different so sorts of organisms on the farm? Well, twofold. Just like, just like us, we wouldn't want to eat the same thing all the time. And there are different foods that humans eat that have different beneficial uh, nutritional values. Same thing goes with livestock. Um, so we want to have diversified mix for them, for their health and for their growth, but also for the soil. So having different types of uh, plants that have different root systems will help us ret retain rainwater um, and just help build the soil quality. Fascinating. So it's I all think what's really cool about what Donna's working on with the intentional grazing and having a diverse like pasture community is that that's I think it'll actually benefit the honeybees mm -hmm. and that we'll get higher honey yields. Um, all the world records for honey production are pre World War II. So like we haven't been able to produce near as much honey as our grandparents did or great grandparents did because of the lack of forage. Um, there's been a big shift in how people raise cattle yeah. to do monocultures, monocultures of fescue and then you feed silage mm -hmm. or hay or something like that. And so I think what's, what's really cool is that better beef might mean better honey, which is sure. a really neat correlation. Yeah, I love that. That's great. That means a win-win for the farmers, for the land and for the bees. Yeah. Perfect. Right. All right, well, thank you all. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we'll find out more about what you're working on later. Sounds good. Thanks.